So what do you guys uh, remember from the first class that you guys, uh, that we went through? Anybody care to? There's two types of sorrows. <coughs> okay, two types of sorrows. Worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Okay. All right. Uh, do you guys remember um, what? How worldly sorrow? How you? How you can tell if it's worldly sorrow or not? Worldly sorrow. Okay. Yeah. If you're going through something, if you feel broken, um, how can you tell that you're having a worldly type of brokenness versus a godly type of brokenness? When you don't feel any hope, I mean, hope for an end to that sorrow. Okay, when you feel absolutely, utterly hopeless. Well, yeah, the, like, the direction of your sorrow is leading you to uh, pretty much suicide or something that makes you do makes you do something other than godly. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, the, one, the one thing that characterizes godly brokenness is... Um, a turning towards God, right? If it's not turning towards God, then it's not a godly kind of brokenness. And so, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to lead to like suicide, um, but although that can happen, um, but most of the time, it, uh, people that are really broken uh, turn to prescription drugs like antidepressants, or you know they'll turn to weed or cocaine or meth or you know uh, and not even drugs like some people can turn to um, the gym uh, work um, you know junk food uh, so there's a lot of things that we can turn to that are not God you know to deal with our brokenness and that's how and that's how we know, you know, whether it's godly or not. Uh, versus godly brokenness um, that always turns us towards God because, you know, that's where our hope is. Um, so last class, we kind of went through, um, you know, the fact that God himself breaks people. And uh, so we talked a little bit about uh, David. Um, and I think uh, Elijah was it Elijah? Elijah, I think the uh, the person that was leaping into his couch or his bed. Yeah. To sleep. Oh yeah, that was David. Yeah. That was David. Yeah, that was David. Yes. Um, we also talked about Hannah. How uh, we read that she was barren, and um, you know, basically, she came to a spot where she prayed in the bitterness of her soul. You know, and when you think about it, um, did God plan Samuel? Like, when you think about it, Samuel, the prophet, had always been in God's plan, right? Um, God always had a plan for Samuel, the prophet. But at the same time, he... God, in his, you know, in his wisdom, broke Hannah to pray bitterly for a son in order to bring Samuel to life. You know, so, uh, you know, it, it just kind of sheds light on the way that God works. He, God has a will and he has a plan. And in his plan, he breaks people in order for them to cry out to him and ask for the things that he wants to bring to pass. Does that make any sense to you guys? You know, I, it's, it's a very, you have to really think about it to understand it. So the things that are going on in your life will lead to things that God has planned on bringing about. But he's not going to bring them about, but, but he will bring them about in response to you pleading and praying for those things to happen. You know, it's, uh, and you see that through scripture, you know, over and over. So, uh, let's turn to scripture right now. And uh, I want us to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, uh, all the way to 11, 7 through 11. Can anyone uh, read this passage? It says, We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. 
This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. Okay. Now, what version is that, by the way? An LT. Okay. Uh, well, that was pretty clear. Um, so I'm going to also read it in the New King James. Um, but I think Liz's version is probably easier to understand. But there's a couple things um, that the New King James, how New King James says it that I really like. So it says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So, um, in this passage, Paul is talking about, not, like they literally were in fear or, or in danger of death. So for them, this death is literal. Uh, for us, um, it's not. that's not usually the case. Um, but, I don't know about you guys, but... Can you identify with Paul when he says that we are pressed on every side? And there's a lot of pressure coming at us from every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed. What's, um, what does perplexed mean? Perplexed. Huh? Kind of confused. Confused, yeah. Yeah, like confounded, confused. Yeah, have you guys ever felt like really perplexed, com like just confused? You have no idea what's going on in life, mm -hmm. you know? Confused, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Okay, so um, here Paul is kind of explaining, you know, this is almost like a, a, a lifestyle of Christianity where you have... Um, all this stuff always going on around you. you have, you know, the um, you have the pressures of the outside world. You have the pressures of yourself, your own flesh. You know, you have the devil out there trying to sabotage your mind and, you, and everything you do. Um, so, you know, all of that can feel make us feel really broken at times. But, uh, and this is where uh, Paul is explaining that in spite of all of that, when God is in your heart, when Jesus Christ, when you are, when you, when you have that power, you know, that's, that's what he refers to in verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's this treasure? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And what is that? What is he referring to? Christ, yes, exactly. The Holy Spirit. So we have this treasure in our earthen vessels. And earthen vessels is how Paul refers to our just our mortal bodies. We're made out of dust. So that, you know, we understand that the power is of God and not of us. And so, and I know we covered this last class. But, um, you know, what is the purpose of brokenness? What is the purpose of godly brokenness? Right? You know, in a nutshell, is to help us um, stop relying on ourselves and put our complete dependence on God. That that is like the ultimate purpose of of brokenness. That is why God breaks people. Um, think about um, how God worked in David's life, for example. Okay, do you guys remember how old David was? When he, when the 
Samuel the prophet came to anoint him as king. Was that 10, 13? Yeah, he was like, he was really young. He was a kid, right? <laughs> Jesse brought all his sons that were older before Samuel because he assumed that one of them was going to be the one because they were all of age, you know? And he didn't even consider David. Why? Because David was so young. He was like, you know, a little kid. So yeah, he was probably between 10 and 13 years old. So, and that's when God decided to anoint David as king. Do you guys remember how old he was when he actually became king? Do you guys remember? 30-something. He was 40 years old. So, you know, we can estimate that it took about 30 years before the promise of God actually got fulfilled in David. Now, think about all the things that David went through before he became king. What kind of things did he suffer before he became king? Okay, there was the whole ordeal of Saul trying to kill him. Um, you know, he had to go hide in caves for, uh, for a, uh, a while in his life. Do you guys remember reading about how he fled to the land of the Philistines? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How he basically, do you guys remember how he, having been anointed by Samuel as the future king of Israel, he almost went to war with the Philistines against Israel. Do you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Do you guys remember how he had to escape out of that? What did he do? He yeah, stupid. Yeah, he, he had to act That's stupid. Right. He yeah. had he pretended he was insane. He yeah. he let his saliva get all over his beard and mm -hmm. he acted crazy. And that's you know that's how he uh and that's how he managed to get out of that situation. But you know, obviously God delivered him from making such a huge mistake of going to war with his own people, having been anointed. But you know, the, the whole point being that before God made David the king, something he had promised to do, God had to teach David that he, could, he couldn't depend on himself whatsoever. You know, he, David learned to put his full confidence in God, to trust not in himself, but in God. So, you know, that's one huge reason why God allows us to be broken. Because He wants us to stop looking at ourselves. You know, which is, um, and we talked about this last class, about how the world, uh, what does the world tell us about um, self-confidence? And being sure about yourself. And the answer is in you. And what else? What other messages do we have? That, you know, come at us from outside. You can only rely on yourself. You can only trust yourself. Yeah, you can, you know, you can only trust yourself. You know, you are your own best friend or, you know, stuff like that. We hear it like self-esteem is a big one. You got to, you know, you got to believe in yourself. That's like the number one message is you got to believe in yourself. And that's antithetical or that's like the opposite of what the Bible, you know, the Bible's like, no, don't believe in yourself. Like you... You know, don't put confidence in yourself. Put your confidence in God. Another example that I wanted to go over in this class is um, the example of Job. Right? Would you guys agree that God let Job be broken? Yes. Right? Now, was Job... Uh, did Job sin before God broke him? No. Right? There was no reason... For God to have allowed Job to be broken. Um, when you start in the book of Job, you read that Job was a righteous man, right? And so much so that God actually pointed him out. You know, have you seen my servant Job? Um, but, and uh, actually let's go there. Let's go to uh, the book of Job. Job 42, 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be, uh, mine says, rotten. 
who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderfully for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing, by the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Okay, so l listen to what Job says here, okay? Especially in verse 6, verse 5 and 6. He says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Okay? That, isn't that an expression of uh, knowing more than before? Right? I've heard of you with the ear, but now my eye sees you. It's almost like Job was saying, you know, I, I knew you up to a certain point before, but now I clearly see. I see even better. I'm more aware of you. What was that? It's like I knew about you, but now I know you. Yeah, exactly. Before I knew about you, but now I know you, you know? And verse 6, he says, therefore, I abhor myself. What is abhor? Why says abhor? Hate. I hate myself and repent in dust and ashes. And that's amazing to me because uh, you read through the whole book of Job, and I don't really see anything that Job said that was really wrong. You know, there's nothing that he, that he said, but yet... Um, after having experienced everything that he did, uh, he repented in dust and ashes. He loved himself because, because he probably, you know, had, uh, he was a righteous man. We can't take that away from him. But in his righteousness, he probably felt that he knew as much of God as he needed to know. You know, that, that he, he felt blessed and he felt like, that was it. But now, he looks back on that and says, you know, that was almost ignorant. Like, you know, uh, in verse 3, it's where it says, Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Right? So, uh, that's another huge um, purpose of God breaking us. Because um, through having experienced, you know, a lot of these crazy things in our life, and when we put our faith in God, like, we come to know God more than we could ever have done before, you know? Uh, to the extent that God wants to use you, you know, to the extent of the plans that God has for you, He may bring you to the depth of you know brokenness because the more he breaks you the more he can use you you know the more that he he crushes or or brings a person to the point of where they have nothing but him to look to then the more that, that he can use that person like you know I don't know you guys can probably think of examples in your own lives of people that you know maybe you know just think about it. Think about the people that have done great things for God. Why have those people been able to do great things for God? Because for some reason, those people have the ability to, uh, to really like put their entire life in the hands of God. You know, um, just off the top of my head, I mean, the only example I can really always think of is Ali, right? Like, I don't know if you guys are aware that sometimes Ali, and I hope he doesn't mind, yeah, this is going to be on YouTube, mm. you know, sometimes they're like broke, flat out broke. They have no idea how they're going to pay the next bill. Yes, and you ask Susan, she'll tell you. And in spite of that, they never cease to help people. You know, sometimes, like, uh, you know, They'll mo most often they'll go to um, Costco to buy everything that they need, but sometimes they can't. They don't have enough. They need to go to like the dollar store and get stuff just to kind of hold them over until they actually do. 
you know, that kind of faith, I ask myself, how do you, how do you get there? It's because God has taken Ali and Susan to a, to a point before where this is not a thing to them anymore. They don't, you know, they don't even really worry about it so much. Like, I, I worry more with my situation, even though I don't, like, you know, being the way that I am, I don't like to put myself in a spot where I have nothing, like, like dead broke, right? I always have a little safety net, mm -hmm. right? That's the way I like doing things, mm -hmm. you know? And so, obviously, if I, um, I could do more if I allowed myself to just flat out, you know, come to a spot where I'm just broke, broke, broke. You're not living life, brother. Right? <laughs> so, you know, and the, the thing is, but I'll confess to you guys, that's because my faith, doesn't carry me that far. Now, by the grace of God, if He wants me to get there, He will get me get me there mm -hmm. by, you know, breaking me, putting me in a spot. Now, do I want to pray for this? I don't know, <laughs> right? <laughs> but the thing is, I, um, I like the way that Spurgeon um, puts it. You know, we're all every servant of God is a tool for God, right? And, and back in the day, if you were like a, a blacksmith or if you were um, a goldsmith or any kind of smith, right? It's not like they'd, they'd be able to go to a shop and buy tools. No. Every smith had to make their own tools. They had to design their own tools, right? And so they had to work with the tools that they themselves designed, right? Crafted, exactly. And so, uh, and that's the way God crafts his own tools. And if he plans to use a tool to do a lot, then he will mold it exactly how he wants, right? He will, and that is a process of, you know, putting that whatever into extreme heat in order to shape it exactly as it's, you know, it's necessary. And all of that carries this idea of us, you know, his tools being put under great heat in order so that he can shape and mold us in order that, you know, we would be useful to him. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes, JC. Um, I just kind of wanted to add a little bit. Um, like, let's say, like, when you buy a new car or something, like, like, we are really grateful that everything in the car has been already been tested. Like the seatbelts, like you hope your seatbelts work, right? Mm -hmm. You hope that the brakes work. And then I think in the same sense, God tests us in order to trust us because a faith that hasn't been tested cannot be trusted. So how can mm -hmm. we use you and know that this tool is going to work if it hasn't been put to the test? Otherwise, he has to put you through the fire and reshape you and, and make you into what he wants you to be so, you, so it can be work. Yeah. To work. Um, yeah, go ahead. How do we, like, reconcile that, though, with, you know, this, we have this misconception, or at least I think it's a misconception that with obedience comes blessings. But if we look at Job, like, he lost everything. He lost his family, he lost his home. I mean, everything. Mm -hmm. And he, like, like, how do we connect those yeah. two? So then the question is, um, and does obedience always come with blessing? The, so the answer to that is ultimately yes. Obedience always comes with blessing, but not necessarily the kind of blessing that we expect in this life. Okay. Um, in fact, over this last week I heard a good sermon over um, John the Baptist. If you read about John the Baptist, the Bible says that he was the greatest man that, that ever lived. You know, there was no one uh, as being uh, the, uh, the son of man, uh, as being a child of man that was greater than him. He was the greatest of all prophets. There's been no one greater born by woman than John the Baptist, mm -hmm. right? Now, you think about Jesus Christ, he was born by the Holy Spirit, you know, so he's the Son of God, 
So he's in an entirely different class. But aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that John the Baptist is the greatest of all people that has ever lived. Okay? Which means that, you know, morally speaking, ethically speaking, you know, obedience-wise. Now, do you guys remember after a lifetime of having served God, how did he die? Yeah, and yes, he got it. He ha he had his head cut off, and before that, um, he spent who knows how long in jail, right? Because that's where they fetched him out of. Now, imagine that. Like, imagine having served God your whole life, and then and then spending the the last months of your life in jail, right? Uh, so, the point being that, yes, you can be obedient to God, but our eyes are set not on the blessings that we may get here in this life. Our eyes are always set on the ultimate heavenly treasure, right? That's the only way to really reconcile that because, you know, yes, God indeed does bless people in this life for having been obedient uh, with, you know, financial stability and all kinds of stuff. But it, it's, it's not always the case. I can't say that that's a cardinal principle. Um, all right, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to read this uh, second passage, in, also in Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. Go ahead, Jason. Are they servants of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one, with far more labors, many more imprisonments, far worse beatings, near death, many times. Five times I received from the Jews forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the depths of the sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, Dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers from the city, dangers in the open country, dangers on the sea, and dangers among false brothers. Labor and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold, and lacking clothing. Not to mention other things, there is the daily pressure on me. And in this, when he wrote this, there was, there was brothers who were trying to... Um, make themselves kind of like leaders and, and almost set themselves, you know, as though they were, I don't know, if better than Paul or, or whatever. And he says, are they ministers of Christ? I am more. And, and then he lists all the things that he suffers for Christ, right? Uh, three times beaten with rods, stoned. He was three times shipwrecked. Um, you know, in traveling... In dangers of water, dangers of robbers, in dangers of his own countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, in the city, in the wilderness, among false brothers, weariness, toil, sleeplessness, hunger and thirst, cold and nakedness, you know, and he just goes on. And like you kind of get the sense of the the strength, the spiritual strength that Paul had. Right? Like, Paul had an amazing strength when it came to the spiritual life. Like, he had a strong spirit. You know? And obviously, it's, he would say that it wasn't really him. It was just Christ living through him. Mm -hmm. But my point is this. Is that, um, that God had to uh, break Paul to a point where he would be able to endure... You know, almost anything. Okay, now think about this. I know, you know, a lot of us like to go to the gym once in a while. Do you guys understand how muscle becomes stronger? What happens to the muscle before it becomes stronger? It tears. It tears. You, you actually have to break and tear the tissue so that when it gets rebuilt, you know, it becomes stronger than it was before. And, you know, uh, 
it's it's not the only area that you see this principle take place. Um, have you ever guys watched, uh, especially in El Salvador, and I'm sure in Mexico it's the same thing. I used to be amazed at, at ladies making tortillas, and they'd be able to pick up uh, the tortillas from whatever that thing is called. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> they'd be able to just pick it up with their bare hands, flip it like nothing. But if I were to ever try that, you know, my fingers would be super, like, burnt. Mm -hmm. You know, why are they able to do that? They're numb. Yeah, the, you know, they have these, yes. like, their skin has developed that kind of callousness. Um, you also see it with, with people. Um, people in the, in like, Mexico and stuff like that, they don't have shoes and they just walk barefoot. Yeah. And then they can walk on rocks and stuff like that. And like, yeah, like things. nothing, you know. It's weird how, you know, it's it's almost like a, a principle where if you um, take something and you really put it through the ringer, like uh, the same thing happens with, I think, sewing sewers. You know, sometimes they poke their, their hands so much that in the end, like, you know, they can't really poke themselves anymore with the needle. Like, they're not even afraid of that. And it's almost like a principle that God shows us in this natural world that if you put something, if you really put something through the ringer, it only becomes stronger. You know, there's that old saying, what doesn't kill you can only make you stronger, right? And so, you know, that is what, I know it's a cliche, but um, it's true, you know. The things that God is bringing in your life right now that you feel like you can't deal with sometimes, those are the things that, will only make you stronger spiritually. Whatever things force you to, to stop looking at yourself and relying on yourself and, and you know, set your mind, set your heart, set your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, those are the things that will, will enable you to, to be more useful to the Lord because it's God's training you. you know, he's putting you through the ringer. He's making you strong. He's, He's forcing you to exercise your spiritual, you know, your spiritual strength, you know, the spiritual muscle that He gives us. So, you know, um, I don't know if you guys have any more comments about that, but that's pretty much the uh, the last thing that I wanted to focus on in this class is the end result of brokenness. You know, that's what we can expect is to be uh, to become spiritually strong through all the trials through all the tribulations you know through and, and I know all of us are going through certain things you know like which one of us isn't going through something right now that we don't really talk about to with, you know with anyone you know, we all have something right now that we're struggling with you know and I guess the, the very first thing I would like to ask you is, that thing that you're struggling with, are you looking to God for your solution? Or are you trying to figure out something else? And if you're looking to God, then you can be assured that God is allowing this in order to make you stronger spiritually, in order, in order to help you get to know Him better, like Job in order to prepare you for some future work that may have for you, like David, you know, there's all kinds of things. And obviously, you're not completely alone. You know, you have a church. We're here to love one another, to support each other, you know. Um, so don't think that you are completely alone either. You know, we're, we're here um, to be a support for one another through whatever, you know, thing that you feel is uh, making you feel broken. So if you guys have no more comments, then I guess we'll yeah. end there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, one thing I'd like to comment on the brokenness is um, a light can't shine through something solid. Like if it's a solid wall or like a solid curtain, you know, the light can't really shine through. You know, God's light can't really shine through it unless it's broken, unless it's uh, like ripped or tear apart like um, you would have to like open it up and then the light can actually like shine through, mm -hmm. you know because it's not solid anymore so uh, that's one thing that i like to point out is that um, we have to be broken 
in order for God's light to shine through us. Mm-hmm. Good. Liz? Um, I read this quote this week. C.S. Lewis says, God whispers in your pleasures and shouts in your pain. So. What is it? Um, God whispers in your pleasures, uh-huh. but shouts in your pain. Uh-huh. So as strange as it may seem, somehow God is trying to get our attention or trust to him through our suffering. Yes. Tough, but for a purpose. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, good. So I guess we'll, we'll end there. Uh, let's all stand and uh, we'll end with prayer.